Greetings, aspiring orthopedic clinical specialists. We are going to take a few minutes here to review the shoulder scenario that, that you have. So I'm just going to, the way that I do this, I like, I like paper. And when I read a scenario, I'm going to tell you the things that I would highlight um, as I read through this scenario, things that just stick out to me that I say, this information might be important for questions that may be asked. And when I'm thinking about questions, I'm thinking about differential diagnosis. I'm thinking about examination. I'm thinking about intervention. So material that might help me answer those kind of questions is kind of what I want to focus on. So the first thing we see when we look at this scenario, it's a 56 year old male. Anytime I'm given an age, and or a gender, I want to pay attention to that. Age helps me because there are certain conditions that are that are more prevalent in certain age groups. So it makes a difference to me if the person is 56 or 86 or 16. There are just certain conditions that are going to be more prevalent in those age groups. So right off the bat, when I see the age, there are certain things that are that come to the forefront of my mind and certain things that go to the back of it. So this patient comes to the clinic eight weeks after a total shoulder replacement for OA. So that's obviously important information that type of surgery they had, the fact that they had surgery is a big deal. The type of surgery they had and how long ago it was, because that can certainly lead us to interventions, what might be appropriate at certain times and, and um, information such as that. So I want to be uh, attentive to that. Now, there's a, another piece here. It talks, it, it says that he fell on the shoulder three weeks ago. So yikes. So now we've had surgery. It was eight weeks ago. And now we're getting information that this person fell three weeks ago on that shoulder and they had immediate anterior shoulder pain. So I'm saying this is someone that just had surgery or surgery eight weeks ago. They fell on this surgical arm. They fell on the surgical extremity three weeks ago and they had immediate pain. So we should start to be, we should start to think of some things that this might be or how we might want to manage this patient in the clinic. Um, so we have pain and weakness as we're told. Um, he denies any sense of instability. So that certainly helps us. Um, and then we're given other information. He just moved to the area. He's been unable to see the surgeon who is so much, so far away. That just helps us because I think all of us would be thinking, if you had surgery and you fell and you had immediate pain, wouldn't, wouldn't we all go to the surgeon immediately? So that just gives us some information as to maybe why he didn't do that. Um, he wanted to begin therapy and now he's 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 begun doing so um but again he moved so he's been doing pulley and active range of motion exercises is what we're given he reports great difficulty with the active elevation so we know what pulleys are we know what the active assistive range of motion exercise is and the patient's telling us that it really hurts when he does those things those are rather benign exercises right the pulleys are not super um they don't put a lot of stress and strain on, on, on any type of structures. And he's doing active elevation. So um, our active assistive elevation. So the fact that he's having pain with some of these lower level kind of benign activities should mean something to us. And, 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 and it should, again, make us start to think of some things about mm, this patient is not doing so well here after the surgery. And now we get active range of motion measurements. So we have 75 degrees of elevation, 50 degrees of external rotation, and they give us a functional internal rotation to the sacrum. So we have to be able to picture that in our mind. And then we have our passive range of motion measurements as well. And, and they're 120 degrees of elevation, 80 degrees of external rotation. So passive is a little more than active. So that's all the information we're given here. So again, when I read through that, we have to know the surgery and I'm thinking we've had some trauma here and we're having some pain and we have those range of motion measurements. So we start to think about a hypothesis here and, and what we might think is going on and what our best course of management might be. Our first question is, what's most likely to account for his physical examination findings. And we have a couple, we have a fracture choice in here, which is definitely appetizing as a distractor because he fell. We have a dislocation and we have two muscular failures. So when we look at this, the, the, the fracture choice we're given is a clavicular fracture. He can still move. So I'm thinking that's less likely. One thing you have to be mindful of with these, uh, with these questions is, there, there is one choice that is the best. It doesn't mean the other three choices are 110% wrong or incorrect. You may look at them and say, that's plausible. But if there's another choice that's more plausible, that's the answer you want to go with. It's which is meant to be challenging. So a dislocation, the way he fell, he's denying any sense of instability. He can still move. So that's a little less likely. So then I'm left with those two choices with the, with the muscular failure. And 
when we're given his range of motion measurements and, and what hurts, a subscapularis failure is a little more, makes a little more sense with the information we're given. So that's why that is our, our correct answer. When we look at our next question, what test is most effective in determining the pathology? So if we're thinking subscapularis, we have to be thinking what test is going to rule in or rule out the subscapularis. And that's what this question is asking. So now we just have to have knowledge of what these special tests are. We have an apprehension test, a belly press test, a jerk test, and a job test. And if we're looking at the subscapularis, our belly press test is going to be the one that's indicated for the subscapularis. So that's going to be the correct answer there. The other tests do not either. They don't test muscle or they don't test the, the, the proper tissue. And now we're asked, patient's age and presentation. What would your first action be? And we're given choices. Contact the surgeon. Perform joint mobilization. Use electrical stim. Work on overhead dynamic stabilization. The correct answer here is contact the surgeon. This is a patient who's had surgery eight weeks ago, fell three weeks ago, hasn't seen the sur had immediate pain after that fall, hasn't seen the surgeon because they live far away. I'm concerned that there's maybe there's a fracture going on of the humerus. Maybe something happened to that prosthesis. I'm concerned about that with, the, with our presentation. So I absolutely want to contact the surgeon. That is the correct answer. Um, you might look at Eastim and ice and say, well, if I have them in the clinic, I'll put some Eastim on for pain and, and ice to, to, to mollify the pain. Um, and that's not, again, not 100% of a wrong answer. But when, when I'm given the choice, when one of my other choices is contact the surgeon, that's absolutely what we want to do because we want to we want to make that surgeon aware of what happened. And I'm sure that surgeon is going to want to see them. So maybe Eastam and ice isn't a terrible answer, but it's not what we want to do first. And that's what this question is asking. What would you do first? And my first action is going to be to contact that surgeon. And the other two actions of um, interventions, joint mobilization and exercise are not going to be appropriate because we don't know if anything's been damaged or injured here. So we definitely want to be a lot more conservative here. Um, our next question talks about more of a protocol question. So they talk about shoulder arthroplasty using an anterior approach. Subscap is typically projected for a period of six weeks. So we're given all this information in the question. And then they just ask, what would you do in the clinic based on this information? So they ask about what would you do to protect the subscapularis? And we're just given a choices of which, which motions to avoid. And when we look at the options that were given, we would avoid internal rotation, resistive exercise, and external rotation range of motion of stretching. Because active internal rotation is going to activate the subscap and that tissue has been removed and, and reconnected. So we want to let it rest. And we don't want to do external range of motion stretching into it because that's going to put tension on the repair. When we look at the other choices, we're avoiding external range of motion, stretching or pendulums, but we wouldn't. We would we would avoid it into a certain range. Um, Another choice has scapular retraction in there. Another choice has postural cueing in there. So those are things that would be appropriate. D is the only one that, that gives us two options that are that are both inappropriate. But to get this question right, we need to know knowledge of the approach. We need to know knowledge about total shoulder arthroplasties and what that anterior approach involves. Um, and then we have to be able to apply it correctly. So we need to know our, our, our surgical procedures. We may not need to know every single protocol because they can obviously differ from surgeon to surgeon. So for, for post-surgical protocols or, po or for surgical procedures, you kind of want to know what the norms are. If this surgery was done normally, like garden variety type thing, we're typically avoiding this range of motion for six weeks. We're typically prescribing this exercise initially. So that's kind of, of, of how you want to approach protocols or surgeries. And I think this scenario gives us good insight into that. So that was our shoulder scenario concerning a total shoulder replacement where we went a little awry, but um, really got us into clinical decision making in terms of what we would do in the clinic. So um, a very worthwhile scenario. Hopefully that that all made sense to us.